our goal is godliness. At least one goal, probably a main goal. Our goal is to be more in and more into God, to go deeper, to grow more, to serve and worship better. Last week, we, we talked about engaging with God, and, and that's going to be our theme for the next number of weeks. And uh, we're going to see how engaging with God will help us in our walk with him. Uh, we're talking about spiritual disciplines, which also help our walk with him. These disciplines are practices that will help with this if your heart is truly with him. And when I say that, that's part of the spiritual discipline is to evaluate our hearts and to see what needs to change in us. Uh, many times we can find scriptures that apply to the questions that we have or the doubts or, or whatever. Maybe we have brothers or sisters in Christ who can help us, but we need to understand the need for change so that we can gain traction and be in him. Don't be unbelieving. Don't be a Pharisee. If you remember, we talked at the end last week about how their lips were true to God, but their hearts were far from him. And we, we don't want to be like that. Uh, we want to make certain that we're listening to God and drawing near to him. Uh, let me tell you, we each respond differently to these spiritual disciplines. And what I mean by that is that there are times that fasting is the ideal spiritual discipline for people. There are times that, that looking at their lives and finding simplicity is, is huge. For some people, that is meaningless at this point in their life. And when I say meaningless, I, you know, it just doesn't do them as much good as they are looking for, I suppose. But there might be other times that, that these things are perfect. And we're going to look at, at up to 20 different things that are listed as spiritual disciplines in the coming weeks. And there might be times that you say, you know, I, I, I used to fast and it worked fine, but this isn't the time for me to fast. That's kind of where I'm at right now. Although, to be honest with you, uh, as I think about fasting, and that's the first of the spiritual disciplines we're going to talk about, the, the biggest thing with fasting is that we usually think about it as relating to food. And in the Bible, I guess it usually is. Here's my point. So many of us would do so much better if we fasted from technology. If we, if we got away from our cell phone, except all essential things to do, and of course, games are not essential, and uh, doing searches and watching reels and, and things like that are not essential not to our spiritual growth, not to our lives day by day. But so often we get caught up in things. It's almost like we have to justify the cost of the cell phone by using it all the time. We don't have to be on Facebook all the time. We don't have to be watching YouTube videos all the time. And it might be that three days or a week or whatever without your cell phone or other technology uh, because, you know, you say, oh, good, I use a tablet. <laughs> well, you understand what I'm saying, I'm sure, that these things dominate us so much to the point that our relationships are impacted, including our relationship with God. The idea of fasting is to come to an agreement with God that giving up a certain thing for a certain length of time with certain parameters, if you will, certain guidelines, are things that are going to help us in our walk with him. And it, it, if, if, you know, we don't fast from food just to lose weight, that's called dieting. If we fast from food, it's so that we feel the discomfort and it reminds us to pray. It reminds us to be in the word and to, to seek him. If we fast from technology, and it might be that we go a month without television. Uh, it might be certain foods that we do without uh, there are other things, uh, maybe maybe reading magazines, because maybe we rarely read our Bible, but always read magazines, and that can be online or those paper things that still come in the mail if you order them and pay for them. I'm sure online there's a cost sometimes, but fasting is really important for our walk with God. It's to it's to understand that we need to make a sacrifice to make certain that we draw near to Him. Now, what's the meaning of a sacrifice? 
a sacrifice is giving up something that you don't want to give up. Think back in the Old Testament times when they made animal sacrifices and the firstborn male was quite often the thing that was sacrificed. The firstborn male was going to be the one that made all the females pregnant. The firstborn male was the one that was going to make sure that the, the herd or the flock or whatever continued and was strengthened. But to give a sacrifice meant to give something to God that showed that we value God and trust him more than what that firstborn male could produce. When it comes to sacrifice, what is it that you don't want to sacrifice? And I understand that that uh, in this time of the year that some churches have lent. And I remember a friend years ago that who gave up potato chips for Lent. But I know a lady who gave up her boyfriend for Lent. He wasn't happy. Now, she took him back after Lent was over, and I think that's around Easter or so. But giving a sacrifice to God, it's not just to sacrifice something. It's not just to say that you have, but fasting or making a sacrifice is to show that we know we need God and we need to be closer to him. And the things that are disrupting our closeness with him are things that we need to change or surrender for a time, maybe forever. But that's between you and God. I'll let you talk with him about that. Well, here's another. How about meditating? Meditating is a little bit different than, than studying the Bible. Um, we'll talk about that in a subsequent week a little bit more. But meditating is to live with the words of God. Right now, I've put a challenge forward to the congregation that I serve to look at a different Bible verse each day of the month. And I, I put a list in our church paper, and, and the one for today is out of Deuteronomy chapter 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one God. Is, is our scripture for today. The one yesterday was, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. The one before that was, uh, For I have been crucified with Christ, and I myself no longer live, but Christ lives in me. These verses are, are verses that I've challenged them to, to live with each day. One verse a day or one small passage, short passage a day, but make certain that you're drawing near to God. Maybe read that verse four or five times during the day. Pray it through. Meditate on it to make certain that we understand each word and how the words are put together and how they impact our lives. Well, John 15, getting down toward the end of Jesus' earthly life and ministry, he says, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love or abide in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than one lay down his life for one's friend. You are my friends if you do what I command. That word abide. It's not just a quick thought. You know, we, we do everything instantaneously or faster if possible. Uh, you know, we get to a point where, uh, you know, instant potatoes aren't fast enough for us. I don't know what's faster than them. To abide, to meditate, to consider the things of God are very important. How about the 63rd Psalm? You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. I have seen you in the sanctuary and be, beheld your power and your glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands. I will be fully satisfied as, of, as with the richest of foods. With singing, my lips will praise you. On my bed, I will remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night because you are my help. I sing in the shadow of your wings. I cling to you. Your right hand upholds me. David knew that he needed God, that he needed to abide in God, that he needed to meditate 
on the things of God. And so we strive to have that closeness with him. You know, if we give God just five minutes a day, and, and I know last week we talked about starting with five minutes a day in the Bible, if we're not already doing that or more, but to understand how important it is that God be in us. And, and many times, minute by minute, we're growing in him or hour by hour, day by day, we're ignoring him. And so we need to meditate on the things of God. Well, we talked about fasting already, but I want to talk about a different kind of fasting. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul's talking about questions that the Corinthians had. And this is kind of an odd passage that you probably won't hear to, when, when we're talking about fasting very often. Um, but as a spiritual discipline, I want you to hear this. 1 Corinthians 7, 1 through 5. Now for the matters you wrote about, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. That's what they wrote about. But since sexual immorality is occurring, each man should have sexual relations with his own wife and each woman with her own husband. The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but yields it to her husband in the same way the husband does not have authority over his own body, but yields it to his wife. Do not deprive each other except perhaps by mutual consent and for a time so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Paul says that, that making love or, or sex in marriage is good and that husband and wife should give themselves to this other person that they've committed to before God and witnesses and whatever. But notice down toward the end here, he said, don't deprive each other except by consent and for prayer. Now, I have yet to hear a woman say that she's being neglected by her husband because he prays too much. I don't know that I've ever heard a husband say that his wife neglects him and his needs because she prays too much. There are usually other problems that lead to people not fulfilling what they're supposed to do in marriage and, and helping the other person. But I want you to see the value of prayer that Paul puts here. That the only reason that a couple should deny each other um, in, in the right context here is for prayer. And it may be that this is a type of fasting, we can look at it that way, that when we come to agreement with our spouse and, and with God, that for so many days and nights, that we're going to do without, without sex, so that we can draw near to God. And again, just like with fasting from food, that when we know that we've got a need that's not being met, it's because a greater need is being met a need for closeness with God. So abstinence can be a spiritual discipline, but make sure you fully understand that passage. Well, how about stewardship? Quite often when stewardship, we think about giving money. Stewardship is a lot more than that. Stewardship is giving our hearts to God. Stewardship is giving our lives to God. Stewardship is giving at least our time, our talents, and our treasure to God in the way that he expects, in the way that he commands. Now, with giving, uh, the Old Testament standard was 10%. I think that that's a good standard for New Testament, for Christians, at least to start with. And I understand that many people, when they come to Christ, or when they become adults, and or maybe come to a realization about the importance of giving financially and, and whatever, a lot of times our time is way committed. A lot of times we're not sure what talents we should give to the Lord. This should be a matter of prayer. And a lot of times financially, people quite often start out at a much smaller rate. And maybe it's not even a matter of a percent. Maybe somebody can give $5 a week or a month. Maybe it's 10. But the challenge to me in, in the Bible and stewardship is to grow in our giving to God. Grow in other words, if you got a, a, a raise first of the year, give a little bit more in your offering and, and maybe a little bit higher percentage than you have, have been given. 
maybe when you get a tax refund, it's an opportunity to, to give some of that uh, to, to the Lord and to the church. And quite often we look at those things as found money. And so we're not going to, we're not going to part with any of that. Is that a godly attitude? Well, I, I can't say that's between you and God, but do what God says, not simply what you want. Stewardship quite often is giving our time. Um, I, I, I'm sadly amused when I ask people if they'll do something, you know, come to a meeting on Thursday night or whatever, and they say, oh, I don't have time. Well, quite often we spend two, three, four hours at night watching television. So guess what? We have plenty of time. We just choose to use it a different way. And I'm not saying that they have to come to a meeting every time I invite them, but I'm saying it's sad that we put our entertainments ahead of doing work for God and, and, and growing his kingdom. And uh, so stewardship is surrendering my life in a way that grows God's kingdom and, and helps us to grow in that. How about solitude? Uh, as, as I read this, I think there are lots of people that have had way too much solitude over the last couple of years. So many of us have been spending a lot more time at home, um, maybe in our own room, maybe maybe we're by ourselves. Um, there's a lot of fear, and, and in some ways, rightfully so, that people don't want to go out and get uh, get COVID or, or have other problems. Uh, and so it's, but the solitude that I'm talking about here is intentional, spending time by ourselves. Um, again, I think it should help uh, to have prayer. It, it should help to have uh, thoughts to meditate on from God's word. And, and, and there are other good writers um, that, that we can learn from, uh, a lot of C.S. Lewis stuff or, uh, or other writers that, that can help us. But solitude is getting away from the hustle and bustle of life. It's doing intentionally what will grow us closer to God. Well, let's talk about one more. Let's talk about simplicity. Simplicity as a spiritual discipline means having less. Having less that controls us. Having less that we need to maintain. Um, I've, I've heard it said that uh, the best day and the worst day of a man's life, the best day is the day he gets his boat. The, the second best day is the day he gets rid of it. <laughs> Maybe the worst day is the day he gets his boat and the best day is when he gets rid of it. Uh, uh, make up your own witty saying out of uh, the pieces here anyways. So many times things control us. So many times if we get rid of more things, we have more of an opportunity to spend time with, with God, with people who mean so much to us, even time to share the gospel of Christ instead of having our things control us. Well, a friend of a friend years ago apparently had 88 boxes that were unopened that she had purchased from QVC or one of the online channels. 88 unopened boxes. Obviously, she didn't need the stuff she bought. And she had a small house. I was never in it, but I saw outside what the house looked like. She must not have had anything but a path to move through the middle of her house with that. Many of us would rather have a fire than have to move stuff like that. Well, I'm not advocating for fires. In Luke 18, Jesus tells us about a man, or Luke tells us about a man who comes to Jesus. As Jesus talks to the man, Jesus says to him, uh, and, and he asks about eternal life. This is called the rich young ruler. Uh, you know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. All these I have kept since I was a boy, the man said. Wow, that's cool. He's, he has an, a, a righteousness about him, doesn't he? When Jesus heard this, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When he heard this, he became very sad because he was very wealthy. Jesus looked at him and said, how hard is it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God? Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. 
The man was wealthy in the things of this world, but he was poor toward God. The man was wealthy and his wealth kept him from doing what Jesus told him to do. We in America are, 95% of us are in the top 5% of wealthiest people in the nation. The numbers might be a little bit different today. I've been using those numbers for a lot of years. But the point is that so many of us look at other people and we're, we're jealous. So many of us look at other people and we say, well, if only I had what they have. Well, I don't know what the if only is. All I know is that it's not very productive, that it actually shows that we're not trusting God very much. We're, we're basically saying, God, you haven't uh, provided enough for me. God has provided enough. If we are wise in the way we use our resources, you know, God always makes it enough. But the rich young ruler, and Jesus says you lack one thing. I Actually, I see two things in here, not doubting what Jesus said, because the first thing was the main thing that stopped him from the second thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor. Then you will have treasure in heaven. Now, I don't know why this man refused to do it. Uh, maybe he thought that poor people would, would waste the money. Um, maybe he felt they didn't know any poor people. I don't, I don't know. That part doesn't matter that much. The point is that his wealth in this world kept him from following Jesus. Friends, we need to have less that controls us so that we can be closer to God. These spiritual disciplines will help if we use them the way God intends in our lives. Thank you, Father, again, for the joy that we have in Christ. Help us, Father, to see that the, the more we get rid of, the more trash in our lives and even good things that keep us from God, keep us from you. Father, thank you for the opportunity to have spiritual disciplines. Father, whether it's fasting, uh, meditating, uh, whatever it might be, all the things that you give us as a blessing to draw us to yourself. Thank you, Father, through Christ we pray. Amen. Have a great Monday.